Is there textual corruption of the New Testament? The obvious answer is yes, but how much, and is it a serious problem for Christianity? In the introduction of this series, we pointed out there are about 40 lines of the New Testament, unresolved by textual criticism, giving it an accuracy of 99.5%. But does the fact that we do not have 100% certainty pose theological or textual problems for Christians? Surprisingly, some skeptics will say that since we do not have 100% certainty, this means we can never know what the original text said. Well, there are two problems with this. The first is that it is self-refuting. If it is true we can never know, then we also cannot know with certainty that we can say we can never know. In other words, to claim it is absolutely true, we can never know what the New Testament was originally, is to claim you have some special knowledge that everyone else lacks and know it is truly lost. But how would you know that? The other issue is it undermines all of historical investigation. If we can never know, then what's the point of academic historical studies? Why not give up on all historical investigation and eclipse all knowledge we have of history? The fact is, all historical or even scientific investigation can never yield 100% certainty. Our goal is to arrive at the most logical and parsimonious explanation, which is what we do in other areas of investigation. Why set the bar to an unreasonable standard with the New Testament if you're not going to do it with other areas as well? Scholars argue the originals are still in the manuscript tradition, and through textual criticism, we can rebuild what the original said. There are some better objections in this paranoid one. One used by skeptics is extrapolation. Basically, the highest rate of variance is in our earliest manuscripts from the 3rd and 2nd century. So extrapolating backwards means there is even higher variation in earlier manuscripts we don't have. Well, there are several problems with this. The first is it is an association fallacy. The scribal habits of copyists from the 3rd and 2nd century doesn't necessarily apply to earlier copyists. This objection also discounts the originals and first-generation copies would still be around to cross-check for accuracy during this time. And particularly, in the first century, many of the apostles and members of the first church would also still be around to prevent doctrinal changes. Finally, this objection ends up getting us nowhere. If we extrapolate variation in our manuscripts backwards, we also have to extrapolate the percentages based on what we do have, as discussed in the introduction. So the 0% of doctrinal changes is still 0%, based on estimated increases of what we have. Doesn't really do the skeptic any good. But didn't the earliest generations of Christians not consider these documents to be sacred, so they would not have been careful with copying? This objection is silly, because even a copyist of a secular document was careful to make sure it was accurately transmitted. This was not a frivolous task for anyone. It can also be challenged if the first Christians considered these works scripture or not. Early writers like Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, and Justin Martyr quote the New Testament several times. Polycarp even refers to the letter of Ephesians as scripture, and Justin Martyr even refers to the New Testament writings as the memoirs of the apostles. So there is evidence in early Christian writings that show they would have at least considered the writings of the New Testament to be authoritative and deserving of respect. The basic point to remember is if anyone wants to argue the New Testament has been drastically changed, that requires evidence. Paranoid suspicion doesn't cut it. New Testament documents were spread all over the ancient world, and we have recovered several manuscripts from the 2nd and 3rd century in various regions during times of great persecution and no political power. There was never any central control over the New Testament, and no ability to produce drastic changes. Manuscripts lost at that time period have been rediscovered today and they would have revealed doctrinal changes in the current text we have, but none of them actually show this. What history demonstrates is as James White says, there were multiple lines of transmission coming out of the first century, all confirming the same message. And they has preserved it through the entire manuscript tradition so that there's never a controlling authority that can change or edit the text, put in doctrines, take out doctrines, etc., etc. The result of that is we have to look at textual variants. But the fact is, that is the best way to preserve the text, especially given the evangelical mandate of the early church. So the idea that, well, you know, uh, if, if there was these primitive uh, corruptions before the manuscript tradition is found in history, therefore we can never know what the originals were. When you have multiple lines, how do all those multiple lines end up having the same readings in them? Not identical readings, but it's still the same New Testament. It's still teaching the same thing. The burden is on the skeptic. The Christian can stand on what historical evidence has revealed. But what about the variants that we do have? Well, as discussed, 
The vast majority do not affect the meaning of the text and cannot even be translated. The many that do affect the meaning of the text are from late manuscripts and resolved by textual criticism. There are only a few, less than 1% of all variants, that do affect the meaning of the text and are from early manuscripts. Dan Wallace estimates there are about a thousand total. But even most of these are not even a real major issue. For example, one unresolved textual variant is 1 Thessalonians 2.7 where Paul says we either became gentle or little children among you. The difference in Greek between the two is one letter, and both could fit with the context. Another is Romans 5.1, where Paul either says, let us have peace with God, or we have peace with God. Again, the difference is one letter, and both make sense with the context. But do either of these variants really affect Christian theology, regardless of which one is right? Of course not. So no variant is affecting theology. It is affecting our understanding of select passages, as Dan Wallace says. The question that we're asking is not which one fits into Pauline theology, but which one fits into that passage. And so the value of knowing about these textual variants is how they affect our exegesis and our exposition, not how they affect our theology. Beyond this, there are only about seven popular variants that skeptics bring up. Well, really only six. No reputable scholar questions if this reading of 1 John 5-7 was in the original. It was clearly a late edition that came over from the Latin, and is not in any early Greek manuscripts. This verse doesn't do much good for support of the Trinity either, since it doesn't explain the doctrine or the nature of each member, and it is so vague it could be used to support modalism, or even Arianism really. Early church fathers argued for the Trinity without the need for this verse, and we've demonstrated in another series the Trinity is confirmed throughout scripture. So the absence of this verse doesn't threaten the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, so what about John 1.18? Some manuscripts say the only Son, and some say the only God, which as scholars note would simply mean culturally, he who is God himself. Does either reading change Christian doctrine? No. John affirms Jesus is God in several places, and that he is the Son of God. Either reading would be fine, and this doesn't affect Christian doctrine. What about Matthew 24.36? Some of our earliest manuscripts omit nor the Son. Does this change our fundamental understanding of Jesus if he did know the time of the coming tribulation? Well, it is debatable if the phrase, nor the Son, was in the original reading of Matthew or not. But even if it wasn't, it doesn't affect Christian doctrine, since the parallel reading found in Mark 13.32 has no textual doubt from early manuscripts. Plus, this verse still says only the Father knows, so lacking this phrase doesn't affect our understanding of Jesus or affect Christian doctrine. So let's move on to Mark 1.41. An early manuscript from the 5th century and a few Latin ones claim this verse says Jesus moved with anger to heal a leper, not that he moved with compassion. External evidence favors the majority reading, but some scholars do in fact believe anger was the original reading from internal evidence of the text. But is this variant a problem for a portrait of Jesus? Not really, since other passages in Mark depict Jesus as being angry, and there is no variation with them in manuscripts. There is nothing inconsistent with the Jesus who gets angry anyway. In fact, internally speaking, one can argue an angry Jesus makes more sense with the passage, since prior to this, it records Jesus was preaching in the synagogue, so the healing was public. A leper was considered ritually unclean, and anyone who came in contact with him would also be considered unclean and must leave the public to remain in the wilderness for a time. And Mark records after this had happened, Jesus had to go into the wilderness once the word got out that he had healed a leper. Having to heal the leper publicly meant Jesus' ministry in Galilee was being hindered by being ritually unclean. The leper could have waited to be healed privately and could have honored Jesus' request to keep it unknown. So it is reasonable that Jesus would be angry about this. As Bach and Wallace say, becoming angry only strengthens the image we see of Jesus in this gospel by making it wholly consistent with the other texts that speak of his anger. It doesn't significantly alter the picture we have of Jesus, but instead strengthens what Mark says elsewhere. So now let's move on to Hebrews 2.9. Most manuscripts say Jesus died by the grace of God, whereas three from the 10th century say he died apart from God. Plus, many early church fathers seem to affirm this reading, as well as a few later translated manuscripts. But how does this affect Christian doctrine? Do not several passages say Christ's death was given to us by the grace of God? Doesn't scripture teach Jesus died apart from God? Or that without God's help, Jesus experienced death on behalf of all humanity? Strong cases can be made for either reading, but either way, 
Whichever was original, the variant doesn't affect Christian doctrine. So finally, we will look at the two largest variants. John chapter 8 and the long ending of Mark do not appear in our early manuscripts, and I know of very few scholars that consider them authentic. Some arguments can be made for their possible authenticity, but that is not the point of this video. The point is, even considering that these texts were probably not in the originals, removing them still doesn't change any Christian doctrine. As Bach and Wallace say, it needs to be stressed that these passages change no fundamental doctrine, no core belief even though much emotional baggage is attached to them. The probability of their not having been part of the original text has been understood for more than a century, yet no theological formulations have been altered. So none of these variants are really a threat. And we need to remember, no disputed variants are hidden from Christians, and just about any study Bible will put notes on the side saying that some manuscripts differ here or there. This is not secret information for anyone who has done their homework, because there is no reason to keep it a secret. But does the fact that there is variation in our manuscripts pose a problem in itself? Aren't we supposed to have the inerrant word of God, preserving every letter for all time? I think this is a drastic claim that some modern Christians and skeptics have put forward, but this view of scripture was not even kept by the early church or the apostles. The real purpose of the New Testament was to preserve the faith handed down from the apostles, not to create an inerrant relic as some have turned the Bible into. The apostles didn't even apply this standard. Look at how they quote the Old Testament. Most of the time they quote from the Greek Septuagint, but there are times when they quote from the Hebrew Masoretic text and variations between them. They didn't expect every single word to be perfect for it to be an authoritative witness of the faith handed down. The point of the New Testament is to preserve the message of Christ and what he did for us, and it has been with a 99.5% accuracy, as the evidence shows. Remember, it is the gospel that saves, not perfect copying. I'll leave you with the words of scholar Craig Evans. Let me put it this way. What did Peter and the other original followers of Jesus proclaim following the experience of the resurrection? Peter and the rest of the apostles proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus. For them, this was the good news. This was conclusive evidence that God was at work in the ministry in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Peter didn't stand up and proclaim, Men of Israel, I have good news. The Bible is verbally inspired and therefore inerrant, and moreover, the Gospels can be harmonized. It was the reality of the resurrection and its impact on those who heard and responded to it in faith that propelled the New Testament forward, not mistake-free scripture.